Aloha and welcome to Instructional Design and Development Part 2, Instructional Analysis. I'm Dr. Katherine P. Fulford, Professor, Learning Design and Technology, University of Hawaii at Manoa. What is instructional analysis? It's a two-fold process to organize the instruction, starting with determine the order and the necessary steps to achieve the goal, and next to determine the subskills for each of the steps. Goal analysis is our first step. It's important to look at Gagné's learning outcomes to be able to do this well. You might remember that from the last part of the series. First we have motor skills, attitudes, verbal information, intellectual skills, and cognitive strategies. We will look at ways to analyze each of these learning outcomes. First, we want to identify the steps. This is though you are watching someone do the behavior. What's the first step they take, second, third, and so on. You want to be sure to use observable and measurable statements of behavior related to the learning outcome. First of all, we have verbal information. This is our declarative knowledge. When you analyze verbal information, this deals with organizing the information in logical chunks. We call them in instructional design. You can do it in a number of ways, specific to general, general to specific, chronological, even regional. You can even do it by physical attributes, or it can be procedural, even by frequency. There are many ways to do this, and these are only some of the ways. Think of a history lesson, for example. Many history lessons are designed in chronological or regional fashion. A subordinate skills analysis is what we do with all of the other learning outcomes, with intellectual skills being the most difficult of these. No analysis looks the same, just as lessons on the same topic might look different. About 15 to 20 steps and subskills is worth about one to two hours of instruction. This process can be quite a brain teaser depending on the complexity of the topic. Intellectual skills are those complex rule-governed mental processes and cognitive strategies are specialized intellectual skills for managing our own learning. First, a subordinate skills analysis. You start off with each step and break it down into all the subskills that it takes to achieve the step. There is a hierarchical structure of intellectual skills, starting at the bottom with discriminations. Moving up, we have concepts. Those concepts, when put together, become rules, and those rules, when put together, becomes problem solving. So at the top are the higher order rules. This is a complex set of rules that you can perform or generate results. You must ask yourself, what does the learner need to know to be able to solve the problem? The rules come next. These are operations that you can consistently demonstrate. For example, three plus two is always equal to five. Once you learn how to add single-digit numbers, you should be able to do this with all single-digit numbers. Next, you ask, what does the learner need to know to be able to learn the rule? We have concepts. There are two types of concepts. First, these are the things that you can point to or classify. They're called concrete concepts. For example, if you ask a child to sort through and take out all of the blocks out of a basket of toys, they would be classifying those things that were blocks. Defined concepts are a little bit different. These are abstract ideas that you can define. So, for example, the letter three is an abstract concept, but we can demonstrate that concept by taking three objects. And we know that when we have three cats, three dogs, three blocks, that's all the same concept of three. What does the learner need to know to be able to learn the concept? These are the smallest of all of the pieces of the learning building blocks. They're called discriminations. You can distinguish if something is the same or different. So for example, if you were a child just first learning your numbers, or if you were Chinese and learning our alphabet for the first time, you might have trouble distinguishing these things, a two and a five. Both of them have straight and curved lines. Three is also kind of similar. Now the plus sign is different, as is the equal sign, but to be able to do a math problem properly, you would have to be able to discriminate among these different things to be able to put them in the correct order. So when you look at a hierarchy, you look at those behavioral verbs that we use for intellectual skills. 
They are standardized, though you'll have to choose your own depending on the subject matter. So at the top we have problem solving, and that would be to perform or generate, create, explain. There are all kinds of words that you could use for that. Next would be rules. You could demonstrate a rule, or you could apply or calculate. In concrete concepts, we have words like classify or identify, whereas a defined concept, it's easy enough, it's defined. Discriminations might be discriminate, distinguish, or select. Remember, this level is rarely put into a hierarchy unless you're starting with beginning learners. Next, we'll look at behaviors for attitudes using Keller's ARCS model. First, let's look at the verbs that you might use. You might use the word state, agree, or choose. This implies that you'll probably do a survey or you will be watching people's behaviors. In the ARCS model, it starts with attention at the bottom. This might mean aware, considering, or weighing. In other words, you're just starting to think about the behavior that you're being taught. Next is relevance. Is it important to you? Is it connected to what's important to you? Or is it feasible? Confidence is the next level up. Once you've achieved confidence, it becomes automatic and spontaneous. Last and most important is satisfaction. This is where you truly become a role model for the behavior. You can well imagine when you're talking about the importance of wearing seat belts, it's not enough to just know about it and it needs to become automatic. And certainly you can eventually become a role model where you're sure to tell everybody to buckle their seat belt. Next is our psychomotor skills analysis. Again, you do your goal analysis and this is much of the instruction itself. The psycho part, or the cognitive piece, also needs to have a hierarchy, which is similar to that in an intellectual skills hierarchy, but you may not need it for all of the steps. Use the physical behavior verbs for the top steps, and then the cognitive verbs for the sub-skills. Once you have identified all of these behaviors, you'll then be able to write your behavioral objectives, as well as your evaluation items. Next, we're trying to decide what prerequisite skills we think the students already have. We're going to set our entry behavior line to do this. For example, if we gave them a pretest, we assume that they would do well on these three concepts. So we would set our line here. And on the rest of them, we believe that they would do fairly poorly and would need instruction. You notice that the entry behavior line does not have to be straight across. The way you read this is upward. So if you look at the numbers, we expect that the skills become less and less as they go up. The same is true when we've completed our formative evaluation, and we not only have the pretest, but we also have the post-test. Look what happens. Instead of the three concepts we thought being easy, they were different. And so we have to reset our entry behavior line. The way it looks, it should be going upward so it gets more and more difficult as you go along. But our instruction worked well. Look at the difference between the beginning scores of the pretest and the ending scores of the post-test. Next, I'm going to show you a hierarchy on fish and diet behavior that was designed in one of my classes. This was a module developed for fifth grade students. It had four levels of learning, was divided into five clusters or chunks, and learning is always bottom up. First, the students already knew the entry behaviors, so they were reviewed. Then they learned their concepts. Next, they learned their rules. And finally, they learned the terminal objective or the higher order skill. At the bottom, we have the entry level skills. Next, we have our concepts. Then we have our rules, and last but not least, our terminal objective. Although you learn from the bottom up, you design from the top down. Let me show you. I have always found it easiest to design from the top down. So we start at the top and put our terminal objective there. Our fish diet, behavior, and physical characteristics are the three things that we're going to key on. Now what you're going to do is think aloud and break it down. Our two rules, which are also our two steps in our goal analysis, are to determine the diet based on the mouth, diet and mouth. Next is to determine the feeding behavior based on the type of fin used in swimming. So feeding behavior and fin are the important concepts here. 
So next, we're going to identify our embedded concepts in these two rows. Based on the diet, we have fish, plants, invertebrates, plankton, and coral. Based on mouth, we have a beak mouth, a grazing mouth, feeder mouth, and predatory mouth. Over on this side, we need to look for feeding behavior. So we've got pursuing feeder, a reef feeder, and an ambush feeder. And as for the fin, we've got a non-tail fin swimmer, and a flat tail fin swimmer, and a fork tail fin swimmer. Last but not least is to consider the essential basics. This is where our entry behaviors are. Marine life, mouth, feeding behavior, tail fins, and swimming are our expected prerequisite skills. For more study, please refer to these references.